It's going to be a beautiful day. Um, we have some things to do as a congregation. We have guest speakers. We have a picnic. There's a slip and slide. What could go? Don't say it. Okay. Um, it should be a wonderful day of fellowship and uh, together worshiping God. So if you would do me a huge favor, if you can take all that stuff that's hindering you from feeling the presence of God and just let it go. If you need to pick it up after church, you'll be more equipped to do so then. All right. If you can do so without pain, please stand with us. We're going to sing. You're going to sing louder than us, preferably. And we're going to glorify the God of heaven. You give life, you are the you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your So we pour out our praise to only you. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the verse. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the dark. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. That was a little higher than I thought it was.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. As the
Father God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you take the best we can do and you use it for your glory. I pray that you would be with this time together. I pray that you would be with Nate and Tally as they share with us. I pray that you would give us open hearts and open minds with feet that are ready to run. I pray that you would help us to know the best way to shine for you. Father God, I thank you for our visitors this morning. I thank you for those who fellowship with us regularly. I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. And before you sit down, you have feet, you can travel. Say good morning to some people. I'm so excited for this morning for many reasons, and it isn't because I got the Sunday off. You know I love to talk. Um, but we have the opportunity to welcome into membership this morning. Uh, Grandma Betty Catalfi is joined in Valley View Mennonite Church. And what's super cool is immediately after that, we're doing a child dedication for her great-grandmother, or great-grandmother, good golly. Yeah, we don't do that here. Uh, Her great-granddaughter, who has been her great-granddaughter officially since Wednesday. So Ella Kurlovich is going to be dedicated this morning. So, Um, (sighs) Trying to think of the best way to do this. So um, I'm going to pray, because I know that's the beginning of the best way to do everything. And then I'll have Grandma Betty come up here with Mike and... Hmm. And uh, Chad, do you want to come up for that too? And we could have Wesley come up too, I think. It's good. It's good. I think anytime someone joins a church, if they have an opportunity to have a church member that's also their great grandson hold them, I think that that's totally appropriate. Don't you, Grandma? Anyway. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to welcome into membership someone that we love. I thank you for the opportunity to dedicate another child to you, Lord. I pray that we would take it seriously, that we would be blessed, and that we would be a blessing to them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready, Grandma? You ready, Chad? So this is probably the most liturgical thing I'm going to do ever. Uh, 
But just a little first is uh, I've known Grandma Betty for almost 16 years, and she has been nothing less than my grandmother for 16 years. And I love her completely. And Grandma was baptized at 16. She's been exposed to Mennonite theology since the 70s. She's been attending here for about six months. And she would like to be a member, and we are so excited to have her. Wesley just became a member a couple months ago. And you have quite a legacy already. You've got the guest speaker is your great nephew. You've got a lot of people. Anyhow. We're going to be in the back of your hymnal, the responsive reading section. We're on uh, nine, I'm sorry, 490. I'm dyslexic, forgive me. We're at 794, which is the reception of new members. So I'm going to read the leader section, and you're going to read the responsive section. Instead of these persons, I'm going to say this person, for obvious reasons. This person, now presented to you, has witnessed to their faith in Jesus Christ and offered themselves as companions in our obedience to Christ. It is our privilege and joy to welcome them into our family of faith. We freely receive you. Even as Christ has received us, we open ourselves to fellowship with you in worship, study, service, and discipline. We pledge our willingness to give and receive counsel, to offer and accept forgiveness in the redeemed community. We joyfully accept you as partners, both in the care of our spiritual family and in our mission. I think that's all I have for that, but I'm so excited. So Betty Katafi is now a member of Valley View Mennonite Church. That was fairly painless, I know. <laughs> oh. All right, Wes, don't get too comfortable. The rest of your family's coming up in just a second. You guys ready? In just a moment, we'll be in the hymnal again uh, at 791, I believe. I could be wrong. As a local congregation, we bear responsibility to this family. We'll pray for your family, encourage them as they grow together, and do all that is in our power to assist in the raising of Ella Kurlowicz and assisting her to come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord. If you'll make this covenant with the family and can do so without the pain, please stand. We're at 791 in the back of our on the back of our hymnals. And we're going to go ahead and read that together. You have offered your child to the strong and tender providence of God. We rejoice with you and give thanks for the gift of your child. We promise with humility and seriousness to share in your child's nurture and well-being. We will support by our example and words your effort to provide a loving and caring home where trust in God grows and Christ's way is chosen. Our prayers will be with you and for you. May you and witness help make your task both joyful and fruitful. All right. Okay. 
Father God, again, we thank you that this family has chosen to raise their children in a godly way. I pray that you would help us to know how to give them proper examples and accountability and support and prayers. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for the life of Ella Faith Kurlowich that we get to share in. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, it is my distinct pleasure to hand the pulpit over to Nate and his wife, Tally, and they have some twin boys floating around somewhere, so if you see them, they're pretty cute. <laughs> is this on? It should be. It's not yellow Mic check. Oh, we're good. <laughs> check, check. Um, so, hi, everybody. We're back. <laughs> uh, as you all know, Luke might have dyslexia. I got ADHD, which are both gifts because we can utilize them and harness them. <laughs> so I go on rabbit trails, and then my wife does a really good job to keep me not on rabbit trails. I try. She tries. So and that's why I'm it right. still happens. <laughs> and I'm on one, so she's doing Helping. her thing of honing me in. <laughs> but no, um, so. I talked to Luke, and he had asked me to speak, which is always an honor. I love you guys with church family, and reading these are, are awesome. It's right in line with what our teaching is going to be. So um, I'm going to say something real quick, and then we'll, we'll pray. But uh, I was watching Francis Chan today, and he said something that was so powerful. I couldn't not say it, and it kind of goes with it, what we're bringing today, but also... Anyways, he said, do you realize the God that spoke earth into existence? He said, earth be, and it was here, is the same God that lives in each and every one of us. Sometimes, like, we understand that, but when you step back and really think, like, oh my goodness, that God lives in each and every one of us, and we're able to utilize that. It's just, it was something that was like a, a mind-blowing drop mic drop like wow that was awesome so i couldn't not share that today but uh do you want to lead us in prayer or do you sure. want to okay sure. oh, father god we're so grateful for your presence in this place god we thank you for this church that you've blessed with abundance we thank you that um, you are pouring your spirit out on us today god we want to know you more and that's what we're here for god we just want to we just want to get to know you. We just want to be close to you, God. We will go wherever you lead us, God. We will just, we just want to be close to you, God. So I just, I pray that you speak your word today, that your word reigns true in this place. Anything that is not of you, God, just let it fall away on deaf ears. And all the things that you need to take root in hearts, God, we pray for those, those seeds to be planted in fertile ground. And we're just so grateful, God. We're so grateful for you. We're so grateful for what you do. We're so grateful that, that you chose to make your house in us, like Nate said, that you chose to be a part of us, God. We're so grateful for you. So God, I just, I pray that your words are what everybody hears, God. And I thank you that you brought Nate and I here to speak what you want us to say, God. And I just, I thank you for the grace in that. And I thank you that um, it's you that we're looking towards, God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's why I let her pray. She's such a powerhouse. <laughs> like, I get goosebumps when my wife prays, by the way. Thanks. Um, but anyways, uh, so like my ADHD mind works. It's like tons of little things that are like, oh, let's bring this in and bring this in and this in. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> that's what we are dealing with today. Uh, so anyways, and we were... So we're really excited to be here, and we just... More than anything, what Nate is trying to say is we just appreciate your grace. And um, we, we went to Africa, and that's a big part of what we're doing here. We want to share with you guys what we experienced while we were there. Um, when we spoke at our home church at Salt, I basically cried the whole hour. So it was really, really tough on me. It was a very tough trip. So when it comes to actually like articulating that to you guys, it can be tough sometimes. I've had a couple months now to kind of process it more, so I probably won't cry the entire time. But it's still, it's kind of tough, and the things we saw were definitely tough. So, um, and I think that, you know, even when I came, when I spoke at our church, I'm like, I don't even know why, like, I did this, like, I don't know why I'm here, and, 
it was really hard and my, my pastor's wife came up to me and she said you came because you saw things and you need to come back and tell us what you saw you need to come back and tell us like what's going on in the world because a lot of us we never see really outside of this we see the news and stuff but you know what do you believe or whatever but we went and got to see it with our own eyes and it was it was very very difficult but it was also the joy set before us too you know like jesus talks about like he chose the cross for the joy set before him so that's a part of why we're here like we want to kind of bring to you guys like what drives us um to go to africa and go through all this crazy stuff like um but uh, we also want to share with you what we saw and what we feel like the lord is calling us to do and you guys to do and us as a church body to do and we're just so grateful to be here and that you guys have honored us with your presence to listen to um our experiences and how we um have experienced jesus lately so just to kind of amen we're done no, <laughs> <laughs> no uh it, it really, um, so I think how we're going to do this is just give a quick little sermon and then just fill you guys in on what Africa was like, if that's okay with everybody. Um, but before we get started, uh, do you go by Pastor Luke or is it Pastor Johnson? Okay, anyways, yeah, it's a hard one to get used to. I agree, like, just call me Nate, too. <laughs> but anyway, like, or whatever you want to call me, I've been called a lot of things. But um so Luke and I have been in relationship for many years, and uh, I love the guy. He's a man of God, and as much as you guys know the prosperity message, he loves no, <laughs> the real prosperity message, not, not a prosperity message of like, if you want a Mustang, God will give it to you, because I don't believe in that prosperity message, and if you want to talk to me after that, we can talk. If you're upset about it, guess what? God might give you a Mustang, but if he doesn't, it doesn't mean it's not prosperity. I'm talking about true prosperity message, repentance love, truth, Bible. That's, that's prosperity. And if anybody has any questions about what that prosperity looks like, we can get into the scripture and really find out what true prosperity is because that's what God does want for us. Um, and, and going into that, um, that's why we're here, ultimately. That's why all of us are here, is for God's prosperity. And that is the kingdom. And honestly, that is to not be separated from Jesus Christ because the other is hell. And when we look and we think about this truly, like, we, like I said, we take things lightly. Like, oh, God's in us. Like, we realize that, right? We read it. Like, that's Holy Spirit. It's cool. Like, we, and, but we take it so lightly. Just the same as we take evangelism lightly. We take hell lightly. This isn't like, I'm like, every time I come here, it's gloom and doom. This isn't gloom and doom. This is awesome. Like, this is um, something where, like, okay. We can stop gnashing of teeth and separation of God. Like, a lot of things are scary in life, but I don't know what it would be like to be separated from the Lord. None of us do. Every day we wake up, God is present in our life. Rather, you've submitted to Christ or you haven't. He's still present in your life because Luke's around, Tally's around, everybody here is around. So there is God in your life. To be completely separated from that would be hell. And that's what hell is. Like, the gnashing of teeth, is kind of scary, but not having God around is like, I, I don't know what that would be like, neither does any one of us. So in that, I think mostly what I want to say in this is we're going to go into John, but that's my intro to go into John. And, and uh, like I said, my brain is a little bit uh, all over the place because we've tried to prepare it and it changed and we tried to prepare and it's changed. And like, if you know, preparing messages are hard, let alone if you're Nate's brain, because it's like, oh, let's cram everything in really quick. But uh, I'll let my wife kind of take off from right here what scripture we're getting into. Okay. And then what I'll do is kind of intervene back and forth like we usually do. So, so um, I think there's this one time that we were sitting at the kitchen table at some point, and I don't even know if we were reading it together or how it came up, but this has kind of become Nate and my like life theme. It's like our life verse. Um, so it kind of, I think we both sat there and just cried when we read it. It really hit us hard. So it's kind of powered us, like I said, powered us to really go wherever God calls us to go. So it's in John 21, and we'll start at verse 15. So just to give you guys a backstory and where we're at here is, um, Jesus died on the cross. He reappeared to the disciples. It does, it's not really clear if Peter was with him 
but it doesn't say that he was or wasn't, um, at least in John when I was reading it today. So this, remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. He said, you, I would never de deny you. I'll never deny you. I'll, I'll follow you to the end. And then as the rooster crowed three times, he said, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. And then the rooster cry, uh, crowed, and Peter was so distraught. I mean, can you imagine, like, abandoning your best friend that you've known forever, the Savior of the world, for, like, three whole years side by side. I'd never leave you. And then he did, you know? Like, so Peter is, like the worst thing ever right can you imagine being peter after abandoning him when he needed you the most and then he was gone like he couldn't even say sorry he died and he's like just distraught right so then um you know what peter did he's like well i guess this last three years is pointless i'm the worst person in the world i don't know why i even try I'm done i'm gonna go back to what i know best which is fishing. So that's what he did. He went back to fishing and he took three disciples with him and they went back to what they knew because Jesus is gone. We don't really know. Like he came back, but you know, like we don't know what to do. Right. So, um, that's kind of where we picked up. Oh, well then I'm not going to start there. So then they're in the boat and they see him and he said, cast your net on the other side. And Peter's like, I know that. I know who that is. Like, that's my Lord. He's here. He came. Like, he's back. So instead of, like, rowing his boat in, he jumps in the water and swims after him and just faces him. Even though he broke his heart, he denied him, he was really not good to Jesus, you know? He still, like, with everything he had, went after his Lord because he knew him. And he knew he forgave him. And he knew that he loved him. And it was just, oh, it's so good. So, um... They're Sometimes, sitting. How many times have we denied Christ? Like when you think about your like, how many times did I do it yesterday? How many times did I not act how the Lord wanted me to? And that's a form of denying Christ, in my opinion. Uh, we do this on a regular basis. We deny Christ by not, if there's an opportunity to put Jesus in and say, this man's lost. I have an opportunity to show him who Christ is. And don't do it. That's denying Christ. Yeah. If we do not evangelize and preach it, like, I'm... You, you guys' missionary field is exceptional. I've done missionary work with you guys. It's awesome. Like, honest to God, truth, uh, it's Simon Menos, is it like his... What, what's his slogan saying? Like, I read it on a, on a quilt when we were there. Like, blew my mind. I'm like, this is the church. This, what this man is saying is the church. Like, this guy is genius. But he only got it out of scripture. Like, it only is because he read his Bible and he applies it to his life. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> yeah, so, and I mean, that also looks like, you know, you think it's like evangelizing, right? Like, that's. Nate's an evangelist. I don't know if you guys knew that. He loves talking to people and he loves to tell people about Jesus. I am stuck in so many parking lots waiting for him to quit talking about Jesus so we can go. And I'm got like, I'll like roll the windows down in the car and let the kids like scream. So he'll like come back to the car and quit telling people about Jesus. It True. really is like, it's just his bones. But for those of us that aren't evangelists, which we all are, don't get me wrong. I'm not, it's not my core, like, that's what I'm going for. Like, I'm more of a prophet. I like the presence of God. I like listening for God. I love being in God's presence. That's me. Um, you know, for us to deny Jesus, it's not always, I didn't tell my neighbor about it. You know, like, that's right. always the big thing. I didn't tell my neighbor about Jesus. Is God asking you to do something right now that you're saying no to? Are you denying him in a way of, hey, I don't want you on Facebook today. Yeah, I can just look for a second. You know, is it... Oh, you need to talk to that person. Is it, you need to let God something go. You know, we all deny Jesus in a lot of ways. We're human. It's normal. But it's not okay. That doesn't make it okay. So I just want to say, like, denying Jesus means a lot of different things. Like, you need to ask the Lord and see what it is in your life that you maybe should give up. Like, what are you serving? Who are you serving? Who are you going after? What's your goal? Where's your treasure? Where's your eyes? You know, that, so anyway, rabbit trail. But she does it too. I do. <laughs> it's like the grace imparting, yeah. you know? <laughs> so back to Peter. Peter jumps in the water, swims after Jesus. The Lord is there. 
And he sits there, and Jesus is cooking food. The only time in the whole Bible that Jesus is cooking food, really strange, I don't know why, but he's sitting there cooking fish. And I just, I wonder what that conversation was. But to me, it seems kind of silent. Like when I was reading it today, it's like they didn't say much. He just, and when they were done eating is what it said. So I wonder if it was like, Peter's like, well, I'm going to get it. He's going to tell me what I did. Or if he's just like, I'm so glad you're alive. You know, like I just, I kind of think he was like, oh, I'm so in love with you. Like, I'm so messed up. I'm so glad you're here. Like, that's my conversation with God all the time. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you made it. I can't do this. <laughs> all the time so especially raising twins so <laughs> um john 21 15 is where we arrive <clears throat> so when they had eaten breakfast jesus said to simon peter simon son of jonah do you love me more than these he said to him yes lord you know that i love you i feel like this was after a long silence too simon <laughs> yes <laughs> do you love me Yes, Lord. And then so he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, like, you know, scripture repeats things two times, you know, to pay attention. This is three times. Jesus said it in a row. Probably like three times he denied him. I don't know. Just making that correlation. I don't know. Um, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him, the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then feed my sheep. This is the last conversation recorded of Jesus before he ascended into heaven, in John, at least. Um, he said a lot of other things after that. You guys can kind of get into it about following him. But um, I just want to say, like, how important do you think it was to Jesus to have his sheep fed? You think it was important? Kind of sounds like it. And, you know, like Peter was so lost because he was supposed to be the church. He was going to be the rock that Jesus built the church on. And then he went back to fishing. So it's like all lost. And he had to come back to him and tell him, this is what I want from you. You know, so um, that's kind of all I had for that part. Yeah, I just want to add to that. When you read it, John is the one he loves, by the way. I don't know if you guys knew that. <laughs> Out of the 12 disciples, John's definitely the one he loves. He says it a couple times in there. But, but yeah, I just find it funny, like, like you know how we heckle each other. and so, like I, I can see the disciples really doing that. Like, John, whom he loved, I'm just saying, they love me, guys. Like, it's just funny to me. But it makes it real life as well. Because uh, you see failures. Like, and we can look around, and we all know each other's failures. We live in small communities. We can look at Nate's past and be like, <laughs> that guy's at a pulpit? Are you kidding me? But we all have a calling, and that's the truth. And that's, like, above all, um, God has a calling on your life, and that's prosperity. Like, it's hard when you look at these scriptures because you read further in John, and it, <laughs> Peter died upside down on a cross. You read about the other 12 disciples, it doesn't say they lived an awesome, fruitful life with Mustangs and they were ramping and doing awesome stuff with motorcycles. And but like, no, like, like they prosperity. didn't say they had like huge chariots. Like these men lived in prosperity because they introduced Christ to so many people. You know how you know they lived in prosperity is because Peter was in a jail cell singing hymns and praises, yeah. not an American jail cell, a Roman awful, dirty, wet gross singing praises that's how you know that's prosperity that's a prosperity message being full of joy in all circumstances and all things always no matter where you're at that's you yeah. know that's yeah. how you know so um i guess we can transfer are you ready yeah like, so, so be, go ahead i'm sorry <laughs> you're fine so with um feed my sheep right so it's like okay that's a lovely message what does that actually mean does anybody know what it means to feed my sheep? Because 
to me, that's like going out and giving grain to the sheep, you know, like it's, it can mean a lot of different things. So me, I really like to get practical ways of walking out God's word. How do you actually follow Jesus? What does it really look like to love his people, love his sheep? So that's what brought us to Africa, really. So it was kind of a random way that we got hooked up with, maybe you should stay with that. Well, let me, let me intervene. When we, I don't know how the Lord speaks to everybody here. There's many different ways. But for me, a lot of times is he gives me different vision and I see different things. And uh, the, like he just, it's like a story in my head, basically. I don't know, it, it, whatever you want to call it. So I'm sitting down at one church service and it was a, um, a worship set that was playing and the sun came out like, and I had my eyes closed and I was worshiping and like the sun just hit me and radi- like, it was like the Lord's like, this one's for you. And then he downloaded it in my head and it was pretty awesome. So with that being said, like we always picture Christ, the Lion of Judah, like a fierce protector. And the more that like, I, is anybody sheep farmers here? Is does anybody deal with sheep? Mm-hmm. Okay. So anyways, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Callie's parents have sheep. And the more I learn about sheep, the more I'm like, wow, these animals are awesome. Like, Because we think of like the lion fiercely protecting. We never think about what the sheep truly does. Like the sheep from its existence has always provided for us. And, and, and like this was the vision God was giving me. Like, and it's so neat because, and it's kind of like, don't take it at like, they feed us. They can give us milk. They give us warmth. And the craziest part is, if you've ever sheared sheep, it's not the easiest thing to do. Like, you kind of got to get the hang of it. And when you do it, they get cut a lot. Like, they're clippers that are, like, not our beard trimmers. <laughs> like, they can lop a pinky tip off because, like, I caught one once. And, like, I acted like nothing happened because I'm a tough guy. But I was like, oh, man, that really hurt. <laughs> but anyways, like, they're a tool that is kind of dangerous. And, like, if you hit a fold in, like, an armpit, it will slice it. Like, but the coolest thing about them is they heal. Like, you push on it. And the lanolin, the oil in their body and the coagulants, like, it doesn't bleed. Like, you can open the flap of skin and be like, whoa. But it heals. And it doesn't, like, they don't bleed out. Like, they're just... Like, and I think of Christ like that. And then the, like the Lord gave me that vision and they're, they're hurt repeatedly. And if like you can stand a sheep up on its butt, as long as it ain't on its tailbone, it'll sit there and it'll let you shave it. Like, and if they don't, they were eaten. So the funny thing is sheep were there for us, for our benefit. Like we've adapted sheep into being there for our benefit and then if christ is the sheep we're to be sheep like so that means if i cut you you forgive me that means if i forget to feed you you forgive me and you still come with a pile of grain they come running at you like and they yell nate too i don't know if you're familiar they go nate and i'm like oh here's the grain like so they're forgiving they're loyal they're always there they feed you they give you wool they give you warmth they give you milk they give you food and they don't say like well you forgot to feed me or you you cut my armpit and i should have got stitches but you stuck your finger in it thanks like (laughs) that's what i would do (laughs) but i have to be christ-like and that's like the sheep and that was the vision that god downloaded on me so what does it mean to feed your sheep it's it's what what did jesus do how would jesus feed the sheep i'm not talking about food i'm talking about taking care of his flock what would he do he loved them he died for him. He, what didn't Jesus do for the church? We're, we're the church. We're his people. Like, when you look at that, what didn't Jesus do for the church? I'm not talking just about, like, this applies in marriage, friendships, church relationship, missionary. mission. What, 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 what did Jesus do? What would he do for you? You know what I mean? And that's truly feeding the sheep. Like, like I said, talking to somebody is one thing, but living it is another that's just as strong as an evangelist tool as talking to somebody. When I look at them and they're cussing like a sailor and they were in church sitting next to me last Sunday, like, I don't know, man, that probably isn't feeding your sheep that well. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to say it is or isn't, but you can use your own judgment in the scripture. Actually, I'll say it isn't. Like, I, I think it's fair to say it's not. But regardless, going into that, I was in a conversation and this is moving into it. And I'll be quicker. Like, I know we're probably getting restless. Um... Going into this, we went to Zambia. <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be what it was. I never want, we got our 
offered to go to Thailand before, and I'm like, nope, sex trafficking, no way. I could never love anybody like Jesus would love somebody if I knew that's what they did. I could never be in, like, nope, not, there's, I got guidelines, I got rules. If I want to show somebody love that was, you know, a, a pedophile or a monster or whatever, I can't. I can't do it, God. I got, hey, man, I got my walls, and that's where I stop. I got my, <laughs> he kind of chuckled and said, you're going to Zambia. And that's one of the worst places for sex slavery ever. Like, I didn't know it. And when, when I found out, I'm like, oh, you got me again. But, like, it, but that's God. He does that. He molds you. He shapes you if you want to be. But you have, like, that's part of prosperity. You have to put yourself in that position to let God shape you, mold you, stretch you, put you in the fire. And it sometimes it hurts. And sometimes burning off those impurities of gold, as my wife has explained it, like they burn them off and the impurities rise to the top and you skim them. And that's a process that takes work and time and it hurts and it's painstaking, but it's worth it. it, it nothing comes in this world that isn't a sacrifice that's not worth it. Like, I, what does it mean? I'll slow down because I get excited. <laughs> I'm a little passionate. I have some zeal. Uh, so this, how this conversation started and it played out in my head was this man in Zambia has been going through it. Like it, he's lost sponsorship after sponsorship. He's, he should be running on 3500 a month because he employs people and employ the people that he's employing uh, and take care of his family. He's running on like $300 a month and all he's doing is just trying to stay there because God has called him there But it seems like every time he takes a step forward He gets pushed back five and it feels like that to him and he's in that desert that Moses was in and he's like Where do I go? You're giving me a promise land. I can't see it and and it was funny because My pastoral meeting that I went to with my other pastors at my church. I brought it up to him and they said um, I, I don't think God would put somebody in a position to make his family sacrifice. <laughs> and I laughed. And I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I waited till after the meeting because I didn't want to make it a five hour long meeting and like a debate. Like we had to get business done. So, anyways, afterwards, I'm like, I completely disagree with you guys. Maybe you should read the Book of Martyrs. I don't know. Maybe your Bible. <laughs> I don't, have you ever looked at Job? He kind of had to sacrifice something and it was his family and a lot of other things. Like, God. You have to be obedient to Christ. Bottom line, you are obedient to Christ. And I'm not saying God's going to make you sacrifice your family. I'm not saying that. But to be obedient to God, sometimes you have to sacrifice some things. And uh, it might look like it's a painstaking, awful thing. But if you're obedient to God, that's the prosperity message. When you're obedient to God, it'll never... He has track records flawless. When you're obedient to Christ... <laughs> You come out on top. Like, that's the craziest part. Like, my business is prospered because I'm obedient to Christ. My marriage is prospered because I'm living Scripture how it says to be married. Like, wives, submit to your husbands. Oh, that's a bad, scary word, right? Read the verse before it. This is husbands or after it. Treat your church like, the, like, like Christ treated the church. Treat your wives that like. It's not rocket science, but we have this ego thing. We have this thing that comes in play that's like, that's not society today. You're telling me to submit to a man? No, I'm not. Jesus is. Like, read it. I'm not telling you anything that Jesus wouldn't tell you. Submit to your husbands. But the cool part is, if your husbands are being what Christ tells them to be, you're not submitting to him. You're submitting to Christ. You're doing what Christ is telling you to do. And your husband is treating you like Christ treated the church. So it's only beneficial. But, but we have to sacrifice and step over those things and say, you know what? I'm going to listen to what God has in store. It doesn't sound great right now, but that's prosperity. It's a big secret that we forget. Like, that's prosperity. Anyways, we'll go into the Africa now. So we're not here all day and we'd steal all your time and nobody gets to go on the slide and, like, that would be awful. I wouldn't want to do that. People are probably I'm hungry, too. Excited. Hey, she is too. Maybe I'll push her down. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And <laughs> anyways, that was a joke. <laughs> yeah, you're not submitting well enough. For it. No, just kidding. That's a joke. I'm completely joking. joking. But um, so, anyways, a buddy of mine. It, it was completely God ordained. I had no. Uh, I mean, I the Lord had spoke to me before, and, and and I really felt I'd be in Africa, but I had no desire to be in Africa at this time in my life. Uh, 
I'm st we're still pouring into Romania. It's still a mission. It's not like we're like, oh, we're on to something new. Like, we're still pouring into Romania. We're still uh, missionaries there. The Lord has really just spoke to us and said, you're bridges from one nation to another, one nation to another, one nation to another. That's what we are, and that's what we're continually doing. So whoever wants to go to Zambia, raise their hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll talk to you afterwards. I will, I will find you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But anyways, uh, everybody's like, man, you better not find me. <laughs> um, but honestly, a buddy called me and said, this guy's really going through it. He's thinking about leaving, and he's just he's having a hard time. And uh, he said, would you call him? So I called him that night. Meanwhile, this guy, he said, Nate, I was ready to leave. I was cussing. I was not in a good place with the Lord. I was angry. Me and my wife are fighting. If you know African roads, does anybody here know what roads are like in Africa? Okay, if you go on a log trail in the middle of like, I don't know, Davy Hill, or the, the biggest hill in Sparty, and it was, I don't know, still drove on every day by skitters, that's pretty close to what it is in spring, mind you. Like, this dude was, <laughs> he showed me pictures. His, he was this deep in mud. Like, he couldn't open his doors or roll down his windows because his truck was sideways in the mud. And he's ready to quit. He blew his knee out. And like just everything that could go wrong was going wrong. And I called him. And because he, he says, God, give me a sign. Like, why am I here? This is stupid. I'm done with it. I'm done. I don't want to be here anymore. At that moment, I called him. That was his like, all right, confirmation. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. And, and it's not like Nate ever even knew him. So he's like stuck in the mud having this crazy like, Jesus. I'm done with this. This is stupid. Why am I here? And this random dude from Pennsylvania calls him up like, hey, how can I help you? Like, can I yeah. pray for you? You know, it's just, it's cool when you get to be an answer to prayer. If you're like actually in it and you get to be that person. Obedience so. and prosperity. <laughs> that's, what, that's the message today. But anyways, uh, so I meet up with him, talk to him. And more than anything, like, I'm going to tell you missionaries need spiritual support like financial absolutely um spiritual is really hard like the think of being taken from everything that you're comfortable in this church these people that you know and god calls you somewhere pull them out stick them in the middle of nowhere with nobody you know no support no system of somebody loving you hey do you want to babysit my kids i, I trust people because I'm in the middle of nowhere and this is heathen country and people probably will steal my kids like just picture it a little bit and then go wow that would suck I should probably call some missionaries that I know today like please do it because they need you they really 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 need you spiritually mentally physically everything just like pour into them she's poking me <laughs> so um the, so when he's stuck in <laughs> just Make sure you guys hear about Africa. So um, he's stuck in the mud. We call him. So over a couple months, maybe three months, it was really quick. We were like, okay, I think that we need to come and see what you guys are about, see how we can help you, see what this looks like. You know, you can meet somebody on the phone, get a totally different idea of who they are when you meet them, right? So we're like, Nate's like, well, do you think you can go? Do you think we should go? I don't know, I guess. Let's, sure, I don't see anything that says no. Let's ask the Lord. There's been a uh, lot of confirmation in it. It wasn't yeah. like rolling the dice on the table. Like, if we get anything over five, we're going. Like, it wasn't like that. It was lots of confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> like, you made it seem like, I don't know. Shit. Like, no, was, there was lots of prayer, lots of confirmation. It was back and forth, but it was still, it was like a month. It's, it was a month we got to decide if we were going to go or not, and then we're going to leave the next month. So we met this guy, and we left three months later for Zambia, basically, is what happened. So it was really, really quick. We didn't have enough time to really research what Zambia was about. We just saw that they needed help, and we needed, we're needed. we like, okay, well, let's come and see what you guys need to help with, and we'll see what the Lord wants to do for you. So it was just really, really quick. And so then when we, I think after we bought our tickets. Because if we did research it, we probably wouldn't have went, like yeah, in all honesty. Yeah, so after we bought our tickets and we started, like, you know, fundraising and, like, telling people about Zambia, so we start researching it, what it's about. So I'll just throw some statistics at you so you know, like, where we went. So Zambia is... Um, middle Africa, middle south. It's, yeah, middle south. It's right above, like, there's South Africa, Zimbabwe, and then Zambia. So then it's kind of... And then the Congo right there. So it's really... Um, it's. In the middle, yeah. So I'm just going to throw some facts at you. So Zambia is just torn apart by AIDS and HIV, like most of Africa. 
So um, the life expectancy rate there is about 32 to 39 years old. So you have- I heard it bumped to 40. I heard it actually bumped in up. In areas, it's 40, you know. So the problem is, is that you have all these people that they don't ha aren't educated enough to really understand like how to protect themselves from it. And then you have all these children that are raising themselves because all the parents die. You know, the parents die from AIDS, and then you have street kids everywhere. They so, also don't have doctors, so they'll listen to a witch doctor that yeah, tells them witch if you're a virgin and you the more people you sleep with the more you'll get rid of AIDS so like they're not educated in a mindset that's like oh wow that's probably not a good idea like yeah. so it's it's very the ones that are educated are very educated the ones that can't afford school are not at all so it's also very poor um yeah. there's it's crazy there's so the Congo I, I think maybe you guys have seen the movie where they like pull diamonds out of it and stuff like that's really true like that we saw some diamond dealers that have like emeralds and all these cool jewels you can pull out but the thing is everybody all the other countries come in and steal it all so like it's so poor and yet they have enough resources to actually have money but like they're just taken advantage of by the rest of the world so or there's them. or or each other yeah so it's just it's a really really rough place um, there's children everywhere um they're all really really skinny um you know like and that's the thing i remember before we left i said to my church like make sure you pray for me because we're gonna see things but i didn't really know what i was saying <laughs> until you actually go and see it you know we've all seen the commercials and um they're very very skinny children everywhere and you know they their older siblings are taking care of them and they're 10. and you're walking down the street and you have kids coming up to you and trying to sell you carrots or whatever they can get their hands on or just asking for money because that's all they can do and they're trying to supply food for their siblings but it's not just one kid here and there it's you're you're bombarded with children constantly asking you for money or food or anything because it's just to the way that it is there and you know you get people that are there and um you know they just kind of push them to the side because there's so many what are you supposed to do with so many and i mean honestly that's kind of where we're at too like we really want to help and so the, the best way we found to help, and we'll tell you about the whole experience, but the best way we Your found Your heart to grows hard to it if you're from there. Like, they'll tell you. Even missionaries are like, you got to harden your heart. Because it sucks. Like, when you see things, like, we're still cycling through it, and it's been months. Like, honestly, it's one of the, like, because we dealt with gypsy kids, and they're still eating. You know what I mean? Like, picture a 10-year-old. I don't know how to word, like, I'm going to give you PG version. Uh, the only thing they have to offer is themselves, if you catch my drift. So imagine a 10-year-old offering his 6-year-old sister so they can get rice for the night. Like, that's the stuff you're seeing. So you're like, whoo, that's heavy. Like, in it, like, that's why every time she talks, she's getting tears. Like, there's something connected to that. And, it, and in that, you have to say to yourself, are we feeding, are we feeding the sheep? Are we feeding the sheep? Like... I mean, should I get a Nintendo 64 or should I feed my sheep? <laughs> like, should I feed Christ's sheep? Like, those are the serious questions that we, like, when you come back from this, like, it's, it's like, they, what do they call it? It's like a missionary PTSD and it's a real thing and we got to see it. Like, it's crazy. Like, I want to sell everything I own. And I'm like, there's somebody that's talking sense into me. Like, don't, don't do it. God probably don't want you to do that. I'm like, I think he does. Like, it, prove me wrong. Like, it's a battle that's constantly going on in my brain that ha that's happening. And it's constantly going on in her brain. And it's something that I don't know how to explain it. And that's why it's so hard to speak about it right now. Like, uh, because I don't know exactly what God's calling us to do in it. But I know... He's wanting you to pray and come alongside of us in it. And we'll go further into that. Yeah, so our whole goal is like, so yeah, it's a major, major problem. Like it's in, There's so many problems in this country. So how do we actually make a change? Like what is it that we need to do? You know, and a part of that is, you know, you feed them first and you, then you tell them about Jesus. You know, like a starving kid, God will definitely be there in the end and stuff. But it's still like it's a part of feeding the sheep is clothing them and feeding them and so um how do you actually help such a major problem and that's kind of we're figuring that out but what we've figured out is that um so randy and anita trithal they're the missionaries that we we're talking about that are there so uh, anita her parents were missionaries 
from, I think, Pennsylvania somewhere. So and like yeah, Bank so Bank. they raised her in the Congo. She was born in Zambia, but she's American. And she was raised in the Congo, and then she, they moved her and her family moved to Zambia. So she's um, she's very African, but American. So it's her, and then her husband Randy, and then their daughter. She's 17, Katie. They live there. They have a farm. Um, they're her parents raise an orphanage, so they have like. I think there's 18 kids that they raise that all have like their same last name that are her brothers and sisters and they're still there working some of them it's really cool to see so you know you can't go and just hand out sandwiches like it's not gonna it's not gonna do something that's gonna last so um, we are trying to empower them to make a change there is what we're doing that might mean um, getting land and building a big house and starting an orphanage um, it's there's medical stuff there that we're looking into um, they have 250 hectares of land, which is close to like 600 acres. So we're talking about starting horticulture, farming, so it creates revenue. Because what happens is like missionaries uh, can come into a place and be a reliance. And then you rely on the money and the funds that come in from the missionaries. Then you are creating a welfare system, basically. We don't, like, every missionary needs an exit strategy. Come in introduce God, disciple, pull out. Empower like, that's the That's the church. Yeah, you empower the people to be their own disciples, to teach them a trade, to make it. so. Because the thing is, sex trafficking isn't the problem there. The problem is money. Like, there's no money. There's no food. There's If there's no way to even, you don't even know how to grow land or, you know, grow corn or anything, then you can't feed your family. Then they're all going out and selling whatever in order to try and survive it's just surviving they're not so you're trying to figure out a way to empower the people so that you can step away and they can start thriving on their own is kind of like we we saw the devastation of just what it looks like to just survive with nothing i mean they're they're tearing the they're tear, tearing down this forest it's a huge giant rainforest and it's almost all gone because they they turn it into charcoal to sell because, I mean, what do you expect them to do? Like, it stinks, like the forest going away, the but crazy part what are they is, supposed to do? Like, they break into other people's land, cut your trees down, and then make it into charcoal just to make money. Like, but you can't even blame them. Like, what, what are their other options? I mean, I would do the same thing. And then you look at, like, you, the statistics there, like, it, we gotta keep it PG because there are kids here. But um, if you wanna talk afterwards, I mean, it's it's you see a world like that and you're like man america has some screwed up things going on but i got news thank you jesus for letting me be here thank you lord for putting me in this nation rather yeah. it's democrat republican whatever who cares yeah. so i mean a part of when even when i was there and i was like having i, I didn't exactly have meltdowns until i got back if i'm just being completely transparent with you guys like it was so hard i think i just kind of closed off and didn't really know what to do. I, well, the one, the one point we stopped to get um, get some fruit from a vendor, and there was like 20 kids that came and knocked on the window, and they're all trying to get in and just trying to get you to buy something from them. And we only need two things, you know. We can't. And so it was just, um, I kind of had a meltdown that day. But yeah. it was, um, it's like, you know, why, why is it that we live in America? You know, how come I got to be blessed and the fact to be that here, you and are? then my yeah. kids are fed every day you know they they have a playground that they can go to like I have five kids that don't need anything and these these kids are all dying of starvation like they're dying and um and Nate's like well it's because are they gonna if they were in America would they do something about it I'm like uh, I don't know I guess so I guess that's what why we we're in America is because we can do something about it it's kind of what I'm starting to wrap my brain around a little bit um like I said, it's been two months. I don't think I talked about it for at least two weeks. <laughs> um, I'm get. I, she just hid. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's a real like. It's tough. It's, it's real. It's really tough. real. Like we've been to Romania, been to Colombia, um, Mexico. It's nothing like Africa. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's a different. It's a different place. So imagine having five children and you can only take care of four, and you're subjected to get rid of one of them. You have to Which one are you going to get rid of? You know? They get rid of the most. Uh, dis, you know, Unruly. functional kid, the most dysfunctional kid. 
uh, the kid with ADHD. I would have been on the street. I would have been trying to figure out how I can live at the age of eight. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's, you can't wrap your brain. My son still asked me to make him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and he's 12. And I'm looking at a kid working the field at eight by himself and nobody teaching him in a fatherless community. And I'm like, how has this even happened? I try really hard not to tell the kids that, you know, what's going on now. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. like, there's, there's, it's crazy to look at the lifestyle that they're subjected to and say anything negative and, and where we're at, like to be in a place of like, man, if, if I wish I could take what I seen and bring it and display it for you. I can't, uh, if you did it like, cause the cool part is we can watch TV and see the kid with a swollen stomach and flies in his eyes and be like, Oh, that sucks. Then we change the channel. And it's not real anymore. You know what I mean? When you see it and you physically see it and you touch a kid, it's different. It's so different. Uh, it's hard. You, you walk through these things in it like um, you say to yourself, what can I do to make a difference? And that's, and that's what prosperity is. I believe in it. And I, I honestly, if anything, Randy, Randy Trithall is actually stateside as we speak. He, I'm trying to get him here uh, for a few weeks. Uh, and I'm trying to get him to speak as many places as he can because he's lived with Zambians. Their finance is weird. They'll be your best friend and then you come home and your stuff's gone and it's normal. It's like a weird cultural thing. Like it's, the, you can <laughs> be married and it's not cheating unless you get caught. Like that's, that's the lifestyle. Like I didn't, adultery? What are you talking about? I didn't get caught. That ain't adult. Like it's a weird they become Christians and they still have witchcraftery, like in their life, like they still go to the, to witch doctors and it's a, it's a different uh, and it's hard to explain until you see it. So uh, we made it really awesome. It's a vacation destination. Whenever you guys are ready, we'll take you. <laughs> Not really, honestly, the only way I can make sense of it is to make light of it because that's what I do in situations like, like this uh, is bring humor. And it's, it's, uh, it sucks. Like, I don't know any other way to say it. And am I allowed to say that? Like at the pulpit, like, okay, <laughs> sorry guys. Like it's miserable and it, it stinks. And we have the capability to change it. Like that's the cool yeah. part. That's prosperity. We have the, we can change that. Rather it's rice in one kid's belly or it's building another church for them to be at. Cause if the, the, the other problem there is the Muslim, community is actually discipling them they're coming in and they're helping them they're helping their families they're creating jobs and they're saying this is Allah and it looks good and it's a false doctrine that they're teaching but they're bringing it with love and and it's it's that's what we're fighting against and uh it's it's hard yeah so um the thing is is like we we live in a fallen world, you know, sin is, sin's here. Um, it's kind of like, what, what's your role in it? You guys need to ask yourselves, like, what is your role? Not just for Zambia, but here in, you know, Spartanburg. Corey. Everywhere is a mission field. Yeah, it really is. So um, just to kind of wrap it all up for you guys, like, Jesus is super powerful. And this ministry, we, you know, it's, he knows problems way before they happen. He is bigger than anything. And I know that. I know he's bigger than Zambia. He's bigger than America. And all we have to do is, like, connect to the vine, and it changes everything. So the thing is, is with this, like, Jesus' love conquers everything. He has a plan for Zambia. He has a plan to fix this. I know he does, and he is guiding us into it. If you guys feel your heart strings pull and us keep talking today um well, there is going to be some opportunity to be a part of this mission field um to partner with randy anita try thought we're hoping like i said randy's going to be here soon so i would like to be I, kind of my goal is with randy we're going to set up some like dinner dates with him and you can hear his side of what it's like to live there and um 
Yeah, I just want to encourage you guys. Maybe we can do a missionary night here or something, oh, that'd be possibly. Cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll talk to your pastor about it and see if we can't set <laughs> something up. I know a guy. <laughs> so I just thank you so much for listening, guys. Like I said, I know it's kind of all over the place, but that's kind of just the way our mind is with it. Um, we don't have a clear plan yet on how to fix this major, major problem. It took a lot of years to get here, but we know that God does have a plan. And I'm really thankful that he's faithful in it. Maybe you're part of the that. plan. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the cool thing. Okay, maybe so, somebody out there is part of the plan of helping us help Zambia. Yeah. Like, that's the coolest part. Pray about it. Like, maybe you are the key to help Zambia be a nation that comes to Christ. Like, yeah. how cool would that be? But you'll never know unless you're obedient. Like, that's, that, like God will bless somebody else in it. He will. Like, there's plenty of people that will take that blessing. So fight for it. If that's you, say, I want it. That's me. I want to bless people in Zambia. Because you can. It's not hard. Honestly, like, I made a kid a toy truck with a circular saw and a piece of wood. And, like, the kid carried it around with him. Like, it was the most prized possession that like nobody he didn't have a dad nobody gave him anything when i built him a little toy truck like he just he carried it and it was his like i've never seen anything like it and I, I go home and i look in my kid's bedroom and there's plastic toys upon plastic toys upon swing sets upon like i'm like these kids are so spoiled <laughs> like i just wanted to like sell everything and give it all to africa and like i said it, it, you have to be realistic in it you have to have a strategy god don't want us nonchalantly just running into a place and being like let's throw tons of money and finance and stuff like no we have to come up with a plan and that's what we're trying to do so if anybody wants to be a part of Project Zambia or whatever. Like. So we're yeah we're looking at like starting a team stateside team of um, praying for them and um, seeing actually coming up with real ideas not just like la 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 like we want ideas and prayers and we can get together and figure out how to empower them to help the country like this is lasting change that can actually make a difference it's not just a okay Zambia sucks later you know it's like we are trying to make a change that's what this is that's what we're doing here if you guys want to be a part of making a change that can actually make a difference please let us know we'd like to set up a meeting with you and randy with us we're going to get a team together that's the plan and we'll be here for a while so we'll hang out with you guys if anybody wants to talk to us more about it that'd be awesome if you don't that's awesome too Uh, Maybe the Holy Spirit will convict you and you'll want to talk to us. That's his job, not mine. (laughs) But um, also, uh, Salt Church is having a festival. Everybody here is invited to it. I'm going to give your pastor some flyers. It's going to be awesome. Bouncy houses, fun stuff, food vendors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, face painting, like bring your kids. It's going to be awesome. What she said, speakers all over. Speakers from all over the world. Coming. Worship teams. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be Jesus filled, and hopefully, uh, bring your uh, children. your and children friends. and your not believing friends and, and your, believing your believing friends, friends and everybody. Party it up for Jesus. It's going to be awesome. But anyways, I love you guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening to our rambling because it's very not organized. That's Sorry. usually how we roll. We try really hard to organize it so. we did it wasn't lack of trying we it's tried. just man the chaos that's in here <laughs> sometimes <It's hard> manage. <laughs> so we love you guys thank you so much if you have any more questions look us up call us talk to us facebook however whatever um do you look want to pray? yeah do, do you want to pray us out or is that something you, go ahead i'd rather i'd rather you pray us out hmm? All right. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I think I'm not alone when I, I feel I feel impulsed to do something, but I have no idea what it is. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. So we can pray for clarity that God lets us know what that is exactly. I just realized I, I butted into Chad's job today. Chad, is that okay? All right. <laughs> Uh, If you can do so, again, without pain, please stand with us and we'll pray together. (sighs) 
Father God, I thank you so much for the speakers we had today, Lord. I thank you that the, you're doing work all around the world, Lord. I pray that you would help us to know how to partner with what's happening already, that you'd help us to know how to feed into ministries that are already happening. Father God, I thank you for this community to fellowship in, Lord. I pray that we would grow and expand, and that we would push out and get more people involved, and that we would just love each other as you've called us to. I praise you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, at this time.